And thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really honored to talk at the colloquium of SISA. E mi scuso se qualcuno non capisce l'inglese, ma spero che tutti lo possano seguire. E so, I will talk of quantum mechanics and as the title says, some underestimated consequences on which I will stress uh, the attention. But first of all, I decided to start very, very slow and very elementary for the non-specialists to remind you what quantum mechanics is and where it started from. Well, everybody knows that quantum mechanics, or maybe I should leave this, uh, applies at atomic and subatomic world. But you could ask only in the domain, the answer is no. If you think of this wonderful machine in Geneva, the accelerator LHC, it works because there are huge superconductors, and the superconductor is a quantum object, which is a massive quantum object, which works because it is at very, very low temperature. But every solid near the absolute zero, which is very cold, to 233 degrees below our uh, Celsius zero, uh, behaves as a quantum object. Then you could ask, only, this happens only at low temperatures. No. Any piece of metal which conducts electricity has a gas of, electro of electrons which is responsible for the conduction, which behaves as a quantum system at uh, ordinary temperatures. Uh, it will become classical at temperatures which are so high that the metal does not exist any longer, but becomes gas. Okay. But the largest system you can imagine, which is the so-called cosmic microwave radiation background, which occupies the whole universe as electromagnetic radiation, is a quantum object, which lives at the thermal equilibrium temperature of roughly 2.7 degrees above the absolute zero and whose energy density per unit volume is represented by this famous curve, the solid line curve, which is the Planck uh, uh, distribution. And uh, it is very important, which is uh, like a sort of bell, because the area behind it is the total energy per unit volume, which has to be finite, of course. But classically, if you calculate this curve or distribution, with classical mechanics, you find an hyper a parabola, which is uh, tangent at the beginning, but then diverges, and you would foresee an energy density which is infinite, which means that classically the equilibrium is impossible. This was the first paradox which was met by classical mechanics, namely the impossibility of calculate the energy distribution, the so-called black body radiation, uh, which was calculated classically by Raleigh Gs to give this absurd distribution until in 1900, precisely, Planck was able to calculate the correct formula, which is experimentally correct, with uh, using a very, very strange hypothesis, which was uh, crazy at that time. Namely, the harmonic oscillator d does not have a continuum values of energies, but a discrete value of energies, which are the integer multiples of some unit energy, which is proportional to the frequency of the oscillator, with a constant of proportionality, which was a new physical quantity, the Planck constant. But uh, this was the first uh, uh, wreck in the continuum, which was the basis of the classical picture, which was unjustified at the moment, except by its success. But a few years later, something even deeper and much more dramatic happened. In order to explain the so-called photoelectric effect, which is what, what makes it possible that our mm, uh, gates of the garage opens and closes when you pass in front of the, of the cell, well, <coughs> Einstein postulated that the energy of electromagnetic radiation is also discrete. And, uh, uh, divided in uh, uh, discrete quantities of energy, again proportional to the frequency with the same constant of proportionality, and a single discrete unit was called since a photon. And the paradoxical content 
of this hypothesis was that the light suddenly, since 1905, had to behave both as a, a system of particles and as a wave system. So the, the ondulatorial behavior was undoubtedly true because the optics had an enormous success and uh, combined with the theory of, of Maxwell, the optics became part of electromagnetism. It was one of the greatest success of the 19th century, physics of the 19th century. But this was a purely ondulatorial picture which had to coexist uh, thanks to the, what the, uh, we learned from Einstein's explanation, the photoelectric effect, coexist the fact that the light itself was composed by individual entities which were indivisible and called photons. So the single photon behaved at the same time as waves and as a particle, which was paradoxical. It was totally ununderstood at the time. And uh, I will say more below on this. Moreover, there were other very oh, what happened? Help. <laughs> Questo è acceso. Moreover, I will continue in words while this comes to art. A new paradoxical fact came up to our attention, especially concerning the atomic structure. The famous experiment of Rutherford in 1911 proved that the right model for atoms is the planetary model for the... Grazie. Che cosa ho fatto? Scusi, così vedo se faccio un nuovo pasticcio. Ah, grazie, grazie. Uh, the atomic model, which was proved to be true by Rutherford experiment, was the planetary model, where the atom consists of a practically pointwise uh, nucleus, which contains almost all the mass, and electrons orbiting around it, attracted by the Coulomb force, which behaves exactly in this case like the Newton force, to which keeps the moon around us. Yeah? And this model, classically, were totally unstable. It was impossible to have stability of matter. And moreover, the energy values of such a system, classically, are, is again a continuous set of values, while experiments showed quite uh, evidently that there was a discrete level of uh, energy values, which are called the energy levels of the atom, which had the minimum and you could not go below that minimum, that was the reason of stability. But why the energy had to behave like that? The only continuous part is the energy of the ionized system, where the electron is free to escape away. So this was also totally unexplained. There was a partial ad hoc explanation coming in 1913, 1911, 13, and developed till the, the early 20s by Bohr first, and then by Bohr uh, and Sommerfeld, which is called the bohr sommerfeld theory, but it was purely ad hoc. The truth was that we could not understand what was happening. For essentially 20 years, physicists were just uh, hammering the head against the wall without understanding what nature was telling us. And uh, <coughs> uh, eventually, only after 20 years since Einstein's three famous papers, uh, light started to come, and we could uh, start to understand this mysterious message of, that nature was whispering into our ears all the time, as we could not understand before. And there is just one word which summarized what happened in the end, the explanation of all these paradoxes, and this word is non-commutativity. I will spend just a second for those which are to totally foreign to scientific uh, preparation, to, because this is the focus point of my uh, talk, to tell you what non-commutativity means. What commutativity means? It means simply that you have, uh, say, 15 pots of flowers, and you want to make uh, a garden. Either that you make three rows and five lines, or either you make three lines and five rows, you need always 15 pots. 
This is mathematically means that the product of 5 and 3 is the same in both orders. And this is commutativity. Well, the key point is that for observables of a quantum system, in general, the product depends upon the other. Is this so strange? It is not strange at all. You can make a geometric experiment, an experiment of, of uh, practical mathematics. You take your pen pointing to the zenith, and you turn it twice of 90 degrees, once around the nadir zenith axis, and once around, say, the south-north axis. Once in the order, first 90 degrees like that, and then 90 degrees, say, like that. And then the other order. The first time, the first rotation does nothing, the second does this. But if you first rotate it, uh, around this axis, you go like that, then you rotate 90 degrees in the up here. So once your pen ends up like that, and once it ends like that. This means that these two operations do not commute. Nothing more. Okay, again, if you are not uh, expert in mathematics, you will tell me what in the hell does that have to do with numbers. A lot, because a rotation is represented by what is called a matrix, which tells you, you just write in columns the uh, so-called coordinates of what the three basic points of, uh, say, latitude one, uh, longitude zero, and uh, height zero. Etc. You put the one in the different places, you have the three unit vector in the three basic directions. You say, where each of these vector ends up after my rotation? Well, you end up each time a point which has three coordinates. Height, uh, latitude, and longitude. You write these three numbers each time for the three basic vectors. You end up with nine numbers that you write in this array, which is called the matrix. Okay. This matrix tells you what the rotation is, exactly. Of course, these nine numbers will not be independent, but we don't care about that now, yeah, from one another. Okay, now if you compose two rotation, this amounts to multiplying the matrices by a simple U, which is called, U, which is called the row by column multiplication. And this is not commutative, and that's it. So you see that even with three by three matrix, you meet very soon non-commutativity. Even by, with two by two matrices, you meet non-commutativity. And with matrices of in all orders. Okay, now, how this came up in, out in physics? It did not came, come out immediately, but in a couple of years. The first uh, crucial step, again, was made taking the full inspiration from the three articles of uh, Einstein 1905. So, uh, where we, uh, had we been able to really understand the message of nature, we could uh, have discovered quantum mechanics in 1905. But that was too early. The bombing uh, of paradoxical experimental results were not yet su uh, sufficient to make us uh, raise the white uh, 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 um, uh, band saying that we could not understand, we had to think something different. Okay, the first step was that uh, Heisenberg took up seriously one of the lessons of Einstein that contained a paper on special relativity, that in order to give a meaning to a physical concept, you have to define your physical quantities operationally. Namely, you have to prescribe uh, operations which can be, at least in a conceptual experiment, be performed, which end, uh, which, uh, whose end is either the measurement of the quantity that you want, and that's always the case, this is the definition, yeah, or in general, the definition of the entity you want to discuss. In the case of Einstein, it was the concept of simultaneity, which was criticized, and this implied having a precise analysis of what measuring the time in a point means. But Heisenberg made the necessary jump, saying, but also when we talk of the orbit of an electron in a Rutherford's atom around the nucleus, we cannot say what in each 
instant is the position, namely the coordinates, the hot in each instance is the velocity or the momentum, if you want, of, of the electron. Because we cannot measure that. All we can do, if you are uh, good enough, is to associate to transitions between different levels some numbers which are the so-called amplitudes which are attached to those quantities. I cannot enter in details what this really meant, but he observed that on such amplitudes you can impose a so-called quantum condition which was just the translation for the quantities that had actually uh, some access for experiments of the Borsom felt conditions. Yeah? He imposed this, uh, these quantum conditions and the miracle is it came out something which, which worked. But what this uh, really uh, really this uh, meant was understood immediately by another physicist, Max Born. Max Born understood that the, uh, you had to interpret this set of amplitudes as matrices, not three by three, but infinite by infinite. Infinite lines, infinite rows. And that he understood the Heisenberg mysterious quantum conditions was nothing but the condition that the diagonal elements of the commutator between those matrices, then you take the product of those infinite matrices, row by column, in the two different orders for the position and the momentum. In this case, I'm talking for simplicity of a one-dimensional system. Otherwise, I should distinguish that this would apply only to the same component of the uh, position and the same component of the momentum. Yeah? And the diagonal elements, you had to impose that it is equal, again, to Planck constant, uh, referred to a single radiant, which is called H bar usually, multiply the imaginary unit. And then Born had the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, dramatic problem. He could not calculate the off-diagonal elements of this commutator. And uh, he asked the help first of Pauli, and he got a really cold and sarcastic answer. But he asked that to Jordan, and he got collaboration. And they proved that the non-diagonal elements had to be zero. And so the real quantum condition was this one. Yeah? And uh, Heisenberg immediately saw that this was the real way to put his ideas. And they wrote the famous born heisenberg jordan paper, which is the real birth of quantum mechanics. But parallel to this development, a totally independent for those events, another genius was at work a bit far away in Wien, that was Schrödinger, who took the lessons of Einstein from another side. He said, as Einstein uh, convinced us that the photon was at the same time a particle and gov governed by a wave equation, at the same time, said Schrödinger, following a qualitative idea of De Broglie, the French physicist, which had only this qualitative idea, uh, the electron and the other elementary particles should be described by wave equation. But uh, uh, Schrödinger succeeded, starting from first principle, to write down this wave equation, which is the famous Schrödinger equation, I did not write it for you. But the new feature I want to stress is that the observables, like the position and the momentum of a particle, again I wrote it in the, one in the case of one dimensional system, had to be described no longer by numbers, but this time by differential operators which act on the wave functions. This was totally strange and totally new, but again, if you look at the, those two operators, which is multiplication by the variable on the wave function for the position, and which is differentiation with respect to the variable, multiplied by, again by minus ih bar, which is the Planck constant referred to a single angle, for the momentum, you get two linear operators whose commutator fulfills exactly the born heisenberg jordan relation, or the born jordan relation. So, uh, again, from a totally different angle, the same uh, commutation relation came out. But at first sight, the two uh, uh, formulations were both good, for instance, to calculate the real spectrum of the 
of the hydrogen atom that was one of the of the first successes but it seemed to be some to com to approaches in competition only in a small footnote of his second paper Sch uh, schrodinger wrote if you take an orthonormal basis of wave functions and you take the matrix elements of position momentum, you get Heisenberg matrices. But it was totally unimportant to him to confine it to a, to a footnote. Huh? And he later sort of regretted not to have stressed that comment more. Anyway, the real final understand, understanding of what was happening was achieved only in 27 with the, the famous paper that uh, uh, the young Heisenberg Heisenberg was very, very young at the time, was meditating when he was sent by his parents to the island of El Golan, the North Sea, to, because he was weak of, uh, of lungs. And uh, he realized that if you analyzed, following again the Einstein uh, uh, dictation of uh, defining only operationally what to measure position and momentum of an atom means, you discover that you cannot measure sim with arbitrary precision simultaneously the same component of position and the same component of momentum, but the two uncertainties has to obey his famous Heisenberg uncertainty relation, which is reproduced here. The, the product of the two uncertainties has to be at least the Planck constant. And uh, these three things that I mentioned so far, the matrix mechanics and the commutation relation between P and Q, the wave mechanics and the commutation, the same commutation relation between P and Q, and the certain relation Heisenberg, are all aspects of the same thing, which was realized in the years after by the British physicist of uh, Britannic origin, Paul Adrien Maurice Dirac, who showed that if you take a more abstract approach and postulate that the observables are just linear self-adjoint operators on a space which is called the Hilbert space, and the states are described by unit vectors up to a phase in that space, you get the general formalism which encodes both Schrodinger wave mechanics and Heisenberg matrix mechanics. And at, at nearly at the same time, Pauli noticed that for any two such observables described by operators, if you define the set that in an appropriate way, which will come in another slice later in more general context, you can prove that there is a generalized uncertainty relation, which relates in a surprising way the commutation relation to the uncertainty relation. You see that the uncertainty relation becomes a consequence of the commutation relations if here you put a multiple of the Planck constant. Now, uh, once you achieve this point of view that uh, observables are operators on a Hilbert space, technically self-adjoint operators, then one of the main uh, uh, diseases in classical picture, namely why the atoms have a discrete spectrum of uh, uh, energy labels for the bound states, becomes of a shining clarity. Namely, there is a shining mathematical explanation why the atomic spectrum looks like that. Because these energy values, both the energy values in the scattering states, which is the continuum, and the bound states, are just points in this, what's mathematically called the spectrum of your operator. And every operator, self-adjoint operator on a Hilbert space, has a spectrum which generically looks like that. Of course, the bound states could be uh, superimposed with the continuous, they could be unbounded on the negative side, several things could happen, but in good cases, you start with a good operator, the spectrum would look like that. And that would be the case for the operator who describes the total energy, the so-called Hamiltonian, of uh, an atom, typically of the hydrogen atom. Yeah. Because a general operator has two kinds of spectra, the so-called continuous spectrum, which will describe the scattering states, and the point spectrum, which describes the, uh, the, the bound states. So this is, I think, one of the rare cases where a general 
simple mathematical statement gives you a shining explanation of something which is physically deep and otherwise ununderstandable. Now, we'll make now a further step. The relevant mathematics, actually more than the Hilbert space itself, is something which is slightly more general, which is uh, uh, represented uh, uh, as a first instance by the collections of bounded operators on a Hilbert space, which are stable for linear combination and products and taking the so-called adjoint of an operator, yeah? but also closed under the uniform limits. These are called nowadays sister algebras. But these algebras can be defined not necessarily looking at Hilbert space, but just in general. You can uh, take any abstract algebra, which is, uh, in some technical sense, sense, what you call a complete normal start algebra, such that this magic equation, which connects product, passage to the joint, and norm, is satisfied. This is all the C star conditions. And uh, in the 1943, two then young uh, Russian uh, 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 mathematicians, and now I, I should always immediately correct me because once talking to Gelfand, we told him, uh, since you are Russian, he corrected me, I'm not a Russian, I'm a Jew. Because at that time, on the passport, they had a stamp, Jew. Yeah? And the same applied to Neymar, of course. Anyway, they were Russian mathematicians, let me say like that, uh, proved that. If you look at this general class of abstract algebra, which are also called sister algebra nowadays for that reason, it's the same class as the algebra of uh, uh, norm closed star subalgebra of bounded operator in Hilbert space. Namely, every abstract sister algebra can be represented as a sister algebra of operators up to isometries. Yeah. This was the beginning of a theory. But now I should make immediately a technical observation for the experts. You will tell me, why do you talk of bounded operators? The position and the momentum in quantum mechanics are not bounded operators. self jump and not bound. But the right operators look at would be this combination. You took the generic exponentials when the exponent put the imaginary unit times the, a real linear combination of all the components of the position, all the components of the momentum, and then you integrate this uh, with uh, a generic function, which is just an L1 function in technical terms. Yeah? And then you get something which is the right expression for the functional calculus in the non-commuting variables Q of P and P, of the function F, which is some continuous function vanishing with infinity, of which F hat is the Fourier transform. Yeah? And the collection, these bounded functions, they are now bounded operators, yeah? uh, generate an algebra which dictates the uh, re uh, correct algebra or the correct representation of the canonical computation relation. So if you want the right uh, representation of this relation, you should not look at the self-adjoint unbounded operator themselves, otherwise you are forced to add some regularity condition, which in technical terms will be the, the, um, the requirement that the sum of all the square is an essential self adjoint operator, or in physical terms, that the Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator is a self adjoint, essential self adjoint operator. You have to add this condition. Otherwise, you look at this algebra bounded operator, and then it you get all the right representation which fulfill the regularity condition. What is this algebra? It's just the algebra of all compact operators on a separable infinite-dimensional Hilbert space. This was proved by von Neumann in 31, which meant that this uh, uh, algebra has only one irreducible representation up to unitary equivalence, and you can describe that irreducible representation, if you like, a la Heisenberg or a la Schrodinger. They are just two equivalent representations of the same relations. Yeah? Okay, but this somehow was, give, was meant giving for granted that all possibly unbounded self-adjoint operators are observables. 
But this was uh, too naive, uh, and it was proved uh, only after a few years by three Ws, Giancarlo Vick, Arthur Whiteman, and Eugene Wigner, or Jenny Wigner, uh, because she was a uh, Hungarian, in 1951, where they proved that if you have a, si a quantum system which contains, at the same time, states with the even and an odd number of electrons, or if you want particles with different spins, integer and half integer like the uh, electron, then you would have that there are necessarily operators on the Hilbert space, self-adjoint operators, which under a rotation by 2 pi are not left uh, invariant. The rotation by 2 pi looks like the identity. But mathematically, it's not the identity. Mathematically, it's just a path of rotations in the group rotation, which cannot be contracted to a point. This is just the geometry of the rotation group. And the fact that it cannot be contracted to a point physically has the effect, in the case, for instance, of, of a, a system both with integer, half integer spin in units h bar, that the rotation of 2 pi is no longer a number, but it has to change the sign of some operator. These operators cannot be observables. The observables have to uh, go back to themselves if you turn by an angle which uh, makes the whole pass from 0 to 2, to 2 pi. Yeah? OK, so you have uh, a, the, a new phenomenon which is called the super selection rules. This was the first example of super selection rules, but the, this was the so called geometric super selection rules, the first to be. Uh, discovered. Now we know that this, in general the superselection rules have a dynamical origin. There are many other, and m there are many other which we are not really sure whether they are superselection rules. With the electric charge, everybody believes that it is a superselection rule. But the baryon number, we don't know. The, the, in some models nowadays, the baryons could also decay. Also, I remember the comment more than 20, maybe 30 years ago by our uh, late year friend and colleague, Nicola Cabibbo, that uh, I'm pleased to no name his name here, uh, who ended a sort, a sort of meeting on the possibility of the decay of the, of the nucleons, saying, uh, let the proton live forever. Should it die, let it die, my arms which was a, a quote by Shakespeare, of course. <laughs> the, the proto was the king uh, in the original. <laughs> OK, now coming back to the general frame, the paradigm which emerged from this discussion is that, the, uh, in general, not only in quantum mechanics, also in classical mechanics, in general, the observables should be described by the self-adjoint elements of an abstract sister algebra, the states will be described by expectation functionals, which associate to each observable the expectation value, namely the average of the possible results of measuring that observable that state. And, uh, <coughs> and this should be the, all the positive normalized linear function of your algebra, which are called also mathematically the state. Yeah? And uh, in the special case where A is commutative, that the product is the same in both orders, then the same uh, years, the same people, Gelfand and Neimer, proved that A is necessarily isomorphic to all the continuous functions vanishing at infinity on something that physically you will call the classical phase space. So you find exactly classical mechanics when A is commutative. But in general, you can associate to an observable and the state, not only the mean value, but also the mean value of the square of the deviation from the mean value. And the square root of this uh, mean value is called the square, the quadratic square deviation, yeah, which is associated to the observable and the state. Yeah. And you can prove quite generally that if you take two self-adjoint elements in your sister algebra, this is now a mathematical definition, you take two self-adjoint elements this is larger, the product of the square deviation of A and B in the same state, omega, is uh, bounded below by the modulus of the value of that state on the commutator. So this is the most general root uh, of the connections between 
commutation relations and uncertainty relations, but also shows you that if you take as a starting point what was the end of my first part of the story, namely the analysis of Heisenberg, you can take that as a basis to say, ah, ah, but then Q and P cannot commute because of the physical uh, information which comes from first principles and uh, the, the um, uh, operational analysis of the measurement of position and momentum that the uncertainty relation must hold. And from that, you can infer that the commutation relation should be what it is. Yeah. Okay, now, of course, if A is a special observable, namely what's called an idempotent, then the spectrum will be just 0 and 1, and then the mean value will be just the number of times you find 1 divided by the uh, number of trials. This is the probability of finding 1. So the expectation value in this case is just the probability of the observable to, of the state to possess the property described by, by your uh, projection. Now, you can define special projections, which technically are only in the uh, uh, phenomenon enveloping algebra, never mind, yeah, which are called the support projection of a given state. If you evaluate the, mean, the uh, mean value of this projection associated with support of phi in another state, you get what's called the transition probability, because it gives you the probability of finding the characteristic properties of phi in the state omega. And this is uh, correctly called the transition probability. And uh, if you describe in a Hilbert space by an irreducible representation of your sister algebra, then to pure states will be described to unit vectors unique up to a phase, and the transition probability you can calculate from there it becomes just the square of the modulus of the scalar product. If your two states are not vector states in the same representation, the transition probability is automatically zero. But when they are vector states in the same representation, you have a new operation at your disposal, the possibility of taking linear combination of these vectors. And uh, if you take linear combination, normalize that, that describes really another state. So you see that from two pure states, you can form a third state, which is called the superposition, which is neither described the situation of the system, it's neither in one nor in the first situation. What does this mean? For wave mechanics, obviously, normal things. Look just at the waves caused, for instance, by a, a, a bot. You see some... Uh, cone of waves which uh, uh, widens up. Then another bot passes, and there's another cone of waves. When they meet, you get the superposition. You see waves which are a bit more complicated, which uh, are just the compositions of the two motions, and that's the superposition. And uh, in optics, that's what happens all the time. You call the phenomenon interference. It's one of the main points of uh, the wave optics. Okay. Now, you see that uh, in the case of, of uh, matter particles like electrons, it is a bit surprising, but it is a natural feature. But as other, I list for you the features which come automatically. I will list you some, uh, a list of properties or features, each of which classically looks very strange, but each of which implies and is implied by non-commutativity. Namely, the validity of one of these features implies the validity of all the others. So, and these are first, some pair of obs observables cannot be measured simultaneously. This means non commutativity. Some pairs of distinct pure states have a transition probability different from zero. This is again one such feature. Some pairs of distinct pure states can be superposed to give a third difference from the both pure state, or some observables does have the so-called quantum fluctuation in some pure state. And eventually, A is non-commutative. Each of these features is equivalent to all the others. Yeah? So when you deny all, you have classical mechanics. If you are not in the classical case, A is non-commutative, and all these features must appear. So you see that some things which appear as mysteries for our intuition are 
just bound to the fact that the algebra is non-commutative and summed up in the non-commutativity. But commutativity is still possible for some observables. You say that A and B uh, are, can, uh, are uh, compatible if the operators commute, which just means that you can measure them simultaneously. This is the case for two different components of the positions, or for one component of the position and different components of momentum and particle. Or, and this is the case which interests me more, if you make an observation in a bounded region of space-time, then the effects of this uh, measurement can propagate at least to the speed of, at most to the speed of light. So if time is represented by the vertical and space is symbolized by the horizontal, the signals produced by your measurement cannot go out of this light cone and this region cannot receive signals from outside this backward light cone. This means that if you make another observation which is confined to such a region in space-time, the two things can never interfere with one another, and then the observables must commute. Making this work, I'm leaving atomic physics and quantum mechanics of a fin finite but fixed number of particles, and I'm entering into quantum physics theory. For, in atomic physics, you have a finite number of fixed number of particles, and every observable is global. It's impossible to describe local observables in quantum mechanics of finitely many degrees of freedom. There is some notion of localization of particles, which goes under the name of Newton Wigner for the scalar particle and for the Bautaugen for the uh, Dirac particles, but that's a sort of a geometric localization which has nothing to do with the relativistic localization I mentioned a few minutes ago. So, locality in the sense that I described for you now is impossible in uh, uh, quantum mechanics. Quantum field theory is, the, is a special branch of quantum mechanics. It's quantum mechanical systems where the number of particles is not fixed at all, but uh, you leave room for the processes of creation of pairs, electron, post positron, for the uh, creation of photons and whatever. Yeah? And uh, it's quantum a particular quantum theory for systems with infinitely many degrees of freedom. How you characterize quantum field theory within quantum mechanics? It seems very complicated uh, if you look at the normal approaches to quantum field theory, but in essence it's very simple. You need a sister algebra of observables, which is highly non-commutative, in the sense that uh, if you look at the center of the algebra, namely those elements which commute with all the others, they're only the trivial observables. So the algebra is highly non commutative But it is generated by local subalgebras, namely subalgebras of observables, which describes the observables which can be measured in fixed region space-time. Then you need this map from a region, bounded region space-time, bounded and nice in some geometric sense, to subalgebras, such that, uh, oops, locality holds, which is what I, I told before, which now disappeared from some reason by my slides, but never mind, namely the two observables which uh, are localized at, oh, here it is, two observables which are localized at space-like separated regions must always commute. Yeah? But you might be surprised, you tell us that something more complicated is obtained saying that within your non-commutative algebra there, are, there is a lot of commutation, which should a priori make the situation simple. But it is not so, because the possibility of having this commutative subalgebra makes the overall structure of A dramatically more commutative. Namely, while I told you in the case of quantum mechanics, the sister algebra, the canonical choice is the compact operator. For mathematicians, the compact operator is a trivial step of the complex numbers. It's essentially the complex numbers. Compact operators are nothing more. Here, it's very far from the complex numbers. It's a very complicated subalgebra. So, what happens here is uh, something like in the Indonesian uh, theater of shadows, by Kulit, that you see a marvelous stories cutting out from light some shadow. 
No? And uh, just to give you a bit of the taste of what I'm uh, talking about, I show you one uh, typical image from Vayankulit. These are shadows, which are uh, actually Vayankulit means the, in Indonesian, the uh, theater of leather, because the shadows are then cutting the leather and then making the shadow on the screen with the uh, And then you have mar marvelous stories, typically of Ramayana, which are represented in this theater. <laughs> and so you, you, got, you get these stories from the uniform light making shadows. So uh, local commutativity is something similar. In the light of the overall non-commutativity, you take some shadow of commutativity, you get the Ramayana. Okay, what is the Ramayana of quantum field theory? Is that uh, uh, this uh, locality principle uh, seems uh, somehow magically uh, have a unreasonable effectiveness, Wigner would have said, in determining the conceptual structure of quantum field theory. And uh, I'll give you just uh, uh, the, what is to me the, my, the main example, because it was connected with the, a large part of my, scientific, my own scientific life. life. If you want to describe the super selection sector structure of your theory, you have to look at different irreducible representations of your algebra, but it's wise that look at the representation which are also possibly reducible, but in the end there will be finite direct sum of irreducibles. This is important, yeah? And then you can look at this collection of representation. You don't take all the reducible representation, but those which are uh, mathematically selected by uh, some mathematical criterion, which expresses, I say only generically in words, the condition that your representations are elementary, the states in your representation are elementary perturbations of the vacuum. You can express this in some mathematical precise way. You get up an interesting, interesting structure, which mathematically is called a category. Then you have objects, which are the representations, and arrows, which are the intertwining operators between these, oper these representations. Like the unitary, which makes two representations equivalent, is a unitary intertwiner, but it could have operators which are not unitary, but which are intertwiner. So the two things together, representation, objects, uh, intertwining operator, arrows, form a category. And this category has an, it has an incredible structure, both on the mathematical and on the physical uh, 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 level. We, we in this case were uh, Rudolf Hag and John Roberts and myself in the between the end of the 60s and the first four years of the 70s, we're working on these things. We were interested in the physical side, but each time we wanted to prove that something of physical deep interest is realized, we discovered that mathematically was a sharp mathematical property of this category. Yeah? And I make you the list. What were the physical properties? The structure of super selection quantum numbers, and first of all, the composition of quantum numbers. Then the notion of uh, particle, antiparticle statistics. Oh, uh, sorry, the notion of particle, antiparticle symmetry of this quantum number, namely the conjugation that was very important. This notion of statistics of particles, and we could define intrinsically notion of statistics, so there is no unobservable field operator in the, in the, on the screen yet. Yeah? They were only observable, but this is an intrinsic notion, and uh, what gave us an enormous impact to go ahead was this came out automatically on the basis only of locality to have only the choice to be, apart from the possibility of parastatistics, either para Bose type or para Fermi type. But the alternative Bose Fermi was encoded just in the principal locality, and even more, if you add the relativistic invariance spectral condition, you could prove the spin statistics without any fields, just from really first principles. And this was the first proof of spin statistics based only on first principles. And all these physical features, mathematically, were expressed by parallel, but in a parallel way, but simple mathematical property of the category, which I summarize all in a statement. 
the category I mentioned, the representations we describe elementary perturbation of the vacuum, together with their intertwining operators, this category is automatically a strict symmetric C star tensor category with conjugates and the reducible tensor unit. The reducibility of tensor unit is just the fact that the center is a trivial. And uh, what are this strange structure looking like? It looks like exactly as the dual of a compact group. What is the dual compact group? You take the collection of all finite dimensional continuous unitary representations, irreducible or not, endowed with the operation of tensor product, passed to the conjugate representation, and so on. And you find exactly the same mathematical problem you had. And then it was very tempting to ask yourself, but now, is there such a group for our category? We went and to look in the mathematical literature, we found nothing. There was a, such a theorem for the Tanaka crime, which required much more. Required that your category is already a category whose object has finite dimensional vector spaces, which was far from being the case in our case. What was missing was a representation theorem that any category that has that type can be represented as the Tanakian category. So we asked uh, several mathematicians, nobody knew. John Roberts, who had the preparation in category, who was the responsible of, uh, 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 for uh, we use in that language, asked from people in category theory in 1970, nobody knew of it. Only much later, at the end of the 80s, we succeeded in proving ourselves using essentially the C-star algebra uh, mathematics, yeah, operator algebras, that every such an abstract category is actually the dual of a unique compact group. Right? And uh, as a funny little note, I will add that when our prep circulated, after a few weeks, I got uh, a message which came from Australia to a mathematician in uh, Milano who was in the category theory who turned it to me and this uh, uh, message said Aurelio I heard that two unknown guys named Doppica and Roberts solved the famous fried problem what is the fried problem who is fried fried was the uh, expert in categories to whom Joe Roberts had posed a problem. <laughs> he talked of that problem several times, and then people started to repeat it as the fried problem. <laughs> so we didn't know that it was called the 2A, but that was our problem that we solved the 2A. Okay, why is this so important? Because this unique compact group is the gauge group of the theory. The group of all global internal symmetries, which does not act on observables, because uh, the observables are gauge invariant. But you see it through its shadow in the uh, structure of this category of representations. Yeah? And you recognize it from there. Just to tell uh, for non-experts why it is important, the famous standard model, who is the explanation of the nuclear phys physics uh, at the subnuclear, the quark level nowadays, is based on a com specific compact group, which is the product of uh, U1 with SU2 with SU3. Of course, from this line to the standard model, you have a very, very long way, as Guido Mattilelli immediately tell me, <laughs> stop, you're saying too much. <laughs> it's a very, very long way because you have to pass through interpretation of this global group as a gauge group, first of all which is an, a very difficult step in the algebraic frame, actually not, not yet performed the algebraic frame. You have to include massless particles and whatever. You have to introduce a lot, a lot of corrections which makes the young Mills uh, Lagrange in the end very, very complicated to be written. But this is the root, the basis, the starting point. So if you ask, as I had once, Luciano Maiani asking, why is there at all? a gauge group behind the theory, this is the answer, even if it is far from being the whole theory. By the way, if you want to include in our previous discussion massless particles, then the scheme does, can, cannot be taken exactly as we formulated it 
originally, but you have to modify it. You have to look at the representation of the whole algebra, but the algebra with the light code alone. And look in a special representation of this algebra, which is called the so-called hypercone localizable uh, um, representation. Now, this is still work in progress, mainly by uh, uh, Dieter Buchholz and uh, collaborators, among which I'm supposed to be, but not doing much for this work. And uh, uh, this, anyway, has the, as the conclusion of it is that you get again the same mathematical structure, which predicts the same structure for the statistics and the, uh, uh, the existence of an intrinsically defined compact group, global compact group. Okay, so you see that commutativity, local commutativity or locality, is this uh, mysterious feature. A feature of non-commutativity, but which makes conceptually clear the, a large part of the structure of uh, quantum field theory. And uh, this I uh, not have time to mention in detail. It throws some important lights on the Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen so-called paradox, which is not a paradox at all. It has been already understood since several points of view. I think that uh, Professor Girardi gave some. Uh, clear-cut explanation showing that you cannot use it to transmit a, even any information. But uh, from the point of view of local physics, it has a really clear-cut conceptual explanation. However, this locality, you can ask me, but experimentally, what do we know about locality? We know it's quite okay down to the distance of roughly 10 to the minus 17, maybe 10 to the minus 18 centimeters, which is the finest distances you can explore with our present-day accelerators. But below the scale, we cannot know. We don't know. All we know, and I come now to my last point, which uh, touches what uh, Guido in his kind introduction mentioned at the end. If you go very down, much, much further down, at the so-called Planck scale, which is uh, roughly 10 to the minus 33 centimeters rather than 10 to the minus 17, then we know that it has to break down. Why it has to get break down? Well, first of all, let me tell you, remind you, that the known universe extends to the, to the distance of 10 to the 28 centimeters. So you see, to go from our scale to the borders of the known universe, in logarithmic scale is much closer than going from our scale to the Planck scale downward, much closer. So this gives you the, the cosmic distance of the little from us. Yeah? And uh, what we don't know is what will happen if you want to formulate a single theory which embodies quantum mechanics and general relativity. We know that general relativity is a perfect theory in the large. It describes in a surprising way, a precise way, the astrophysical uh, phenomena connected with gravity, like uh, <coughs> um, binary pulsars. There is a marvelous, that's a marvelous example, which proves experimentally all the predictions of uh, Einstein's, including the indirect proof of existence of gravitational radiation, all indirect. But we cannot formulate a satisfactory theory which embodies both. Unfortunately, here you can say that what really applies is the old Chinese wisdom of, of Lao Tzu, who said uh, at the beginning of his famous text, text he said, Tao Ke Tao Fei Chang Tao. Ming ke Ming, Fei Chang Ming, which means uh, the road which appears to be the road is not the enduring road. The meaning which is, appears to be the enduring meaning is not the enduring meaning. And unfortunately, that's all we can say for quantum gravity so far. Actually, uh, we have not any way, the, the main problem of physics is that nowadays, that we have not any way to uh, get with our side uh, uh, at a uh, uh, very, very uh, small scale. Actually, the very validity, not only of Einstein's theory, but of Newton's theory, which is perfect to describe planetary system and so on without really making recourse to general relativity. If you go to small scale, 
in the laboratory, you should be able to measure the gravitational force, uh, forces between two apples on your table. It's very, very difficult. But you can test with very sophisticated experiments the down to the length of roughly one centimeter, maybe one millimeter. I'm not sure about the latest results. The Newton's law is verified. But at smaller distance than the, this macroscopic distance, we don't have any experimental idea whether the Newton's law itself is still true. So when you say that it still holds down to the 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, you're making a terrific extrapolation, which might well turn out to be wrong. So we really don't know. That's the only we can say. However, not only we have very di many difficulties in, in looking at gravitation at that level, but also we have difficulty in looking at everything at that level, because our experiment stopped at the scale which was explored with LHC, which is already very, very small, but it's uh, almost uh, more or less halfway in logarithmic scale to the Planck scale. Be below that, everything could happen, we don't know. But uh, not all hopes are lost. Because if you look precisely what I started with, the cosmic microwave background, that, uh, that's also the oldest object we can see, in a sense, is the more distant object that you can observe. That's the result of the emission of radiation of the universe in very early stage. Unfortunately, this stage is very early, but not early enough, because the, that's photons which interacted with the hot uh, matter uh, for a very long time, for more or less the first 300,000 years of life of the universe. So what you see is the result of this called thermalization of the background, except uh, the polarization, which was measured recently by this uh, w uh, uh, the refinement version of WMAP experiment, which should tell you something more detailed and older, because the polarization pres is preserved by this multiple scattering phenomena. However, to get from this measurement of polarization information the universe at much earlier stages you cannot do that in a more independent way. I mean, this is not my own wisdom. I'm totally ignorant of these things. But I ask one of the main actors in this thing, which is my colleague in Rome, uh, Paolo de Bernardis, which has made some of these crucial experiments. He said there is no model independent way of extracting information. So, so far, it's fair to say that our knowledge is stopped at the age of the universe 300 years. 300,000 years. There is no hope, there is some hope, because we could in the future dream of measuring not only the cosmic background of microwaves, but also the cosmic background of neutrinos, and especially in a very distant future ahead, the cosmic background of gravitational waves. And this should give information at the very, very first fractions of an instant of life for the universe, and looking very, very far, looking at this background, is exactly the same as looking at the universe when it was the very, very beginning, which was nearly a point. Namely, when the scale of the whole universe was possibly the Planck scale. And that the place where the quantum gravity should show dramatic effects. But it's far from our observation. But, uh, I want to stress this point because there was an important observation made by our colleague in, uh, in logics, uh, Pier Giorgio Di Freddi, who said that uh, the idea that uh, this bright uh, point, which are the initial explosions, that we see looking at the cosmic microwave background and possibly in more detail looking at this other background, so it surrounds us in some way, but it was a point. It's exactly what Dante Alighieri places at the end of the comedy. In the last cantos, he said that at some point, above all the skies of the planets and above the sky of the, of the stars, he goes to the Empyreum, and there he, say, he sees a bright point which cannot be looked at, which is the access to the ultimate entity, to God. Yeah? And this bright point looks like surrounded by angels or orbiting around him, 
and the largest circle of all these things is the imperial itself. So in a sense, this point looks like surrounded, but it surrounds everything. And he said explicitly, parendo inchiuso da quel che l'inchiude. So looking like enclosed because it encloses. Which is exactly our way of thinking of the, of the, of the Big Bang. Okay, and uh, uh, at this point, what we can do? Well, we can suppose that gravity still is represented by classical relativity down to those scales and see the consequences. And the consequences are that uh, there should be, and this uh, again, now the point of view of my school is not a universally accepted point, the consequence should be that the different components of coordinates of an event must obey uncertainty relations. To, say you, to tell you why this came out, just think that if you measure an event with the, uh, uh, uncertainties, the four coordinates, which don't fulfill these conditions, then the Heisenberg principle will force you to concentrate in that region a terrific energy due just to the Heisenberg principle, because if you measure one, something with great precision, you transmit an enormous momentum. If you measure a time with great precision, you transmit an enormous energy. Enormous energy. In both cases, you transmit an enormous energy, which has to be concentrated in a small region, and this, according to the principles of classical general relativity, creates a gravitational field. And this gravitational field, is this relation are not fulfilled, will be so strong to forbid any signal to go out of that region. And then you have not measured anything. Space-time will cease to exist. So you have destroyed the structure of space-time trying to localize an event uh, more precise than that. So the validity of this uncertainty relation is the guarantee that space-time is stable against localization of, gravitationally stable against localization of event. Now, the validity of some uncertainty relation, we know from quantum mechanics, is expressed best by commutation relation. So you can express this by requiring that the coordinates do not commute. And then you have a huge problem to formulate quantum field theory on quantum space-time. The quantum space-time is just the structure that comes out. And uh, in order, and this, while well, we did a lot of work with Gerardo, with Klaus Fedenhagen, which is was the collaborator from the beginning of this project, Dorothea Banz, uh, Gerardo Mossel, uh, a lot of people uh, collaborate in our group, but uh, we don't have a satisfactory formulation overall of quantum physics and quantum space-time, that's fair to say. Also, there is some formulation which is nice enough to avoid all ultraviolet divergences. This is already nice enough, but not enough. However, if you want to incorporate the gravitational force, forces in between particles, namely how gravitationally one electron is attracted by another electron, eh, which should become important at Planck lengths, then the Q mu nu has to become, a, this commutator has to become a dynamical quantity, and this would enable it dependent upon the, the metric itself. And this would make the thing extremely complicated, but uh, all this will be yet a new feature of non-commutativity, and you can extract from this a sort of general paradigm, the quite classical general relativity, the pseudo geometry, becomes dynamic. Quantum gravity should tell you that the algebra becomes dynamic as, dynamic as well. Now, I don't know whether I probably finished already my time, but the, what it was to me very important for this lecture was the last part of the lecture which is supposed to start now, and uh, please interrupt me at any moment if I'm passing too much of my time. But I will uh, try to say at least very few words. To me, the lesson that you can draw from this history I made for you in the in this uh, 45 minutes or whatever is that uh, we could not understand the lessons coming from nature for the right for the long time. In the end, we discovered that the nature has its own laws and its own lessons, which is uh, expressed even by mathematical structures that are completely foreign to our, our intuition. And uh, I can uh, summarize this just by quoting Freud, who said once that uh, Copernic told
told us that we are not at the geometric center of the universe. Darwin told us that we are not at the center of the animal world. And uh, uh, psychoanalysis told us that we are not our own masters, not even inside our mind. But you could say, this is due only because we think of uh, emotional part, instincts, whatever, but rational thought is only human, it sets order in the natural. Not at all. Quantum mechanics tell you that natural has its own order that you can uh, sometimes have difficulties in understanding. So this imposes on us that on the one side, the concept is well clear to physicists anyway, that there are laws of nature which have an objective value. Because when you formulate Newton's law and you saw that the planets obey Newton's law, nobody which is sane of mind would doubt that that has a root in the natural. Why? Uh, uh, often, uh, well, I will comment on this in a moment. I will make some comments which uh, uh, draw from that a sort of very strong naturalism, which is opposed to postmodern views but also some consequences of it for ethics and for our vision of the universe. First of all, for a physicist, the laws of nature not only exist, but they are eternal. Aeneontes, like uh, uh, Homer would say of the gods of the Olympic uh, world uh, in, in his poems. Namely, they exist forever, but not as precise laws, which are exactly embedded in natural. What we know is only an approximate form of this world's laws, because we cannot go farther. But we know that the approximate forms of the law, within some borders of validities, where the approximation needed are valid, always remain true. The fact that we discover quantum mechanics doesn't mean that the planet ceases to obey the law of Kepler. Uh, of the uh, law uh, Kepler. So uh, only the, uh, these borders can change, and the details in the picture of the law becomes finer and finer. Each time we have new theory, we see a more detailed landscape with a very much more precise image, which, of which we can never arrive at the end. Of course, this suggests that the laws of nature is sort of, sort of a partially ordered set. Whatever pairs of laws you have, there should be some uh, higher law which embodies both. We don't know whether this is true for uh, uh, gravity, general classical generative quantum mechanics, but we hope so, of course, otherwise uh, the, the world would be meaningless. Yeah? But there is another possibility that this pro process never stops. And that's what I believe is true. And actually, I'm on the side of Freeman Dyson, who wrote a book on that infinite in all directions, which is opposite to the views of some theory, for instance, string theory. There was some point where Gregory Moore wrote an article in opposition to Dyson, finite in all directions. But then he had to withdraw his conclusion, because that's also not clear. So I prefer to think that uh, there is no end. There will be always finite and finite law. But what we can talk of is the mathematical concepts of inductive limit. It will never reach, of course. And this would be the ultimate uh, reality of objective laws which exist around us. And after all, this is the answer of Einstein. Somebody asked him, do you believe in God? And he answered, I believe in the God of Spinoza, who just, whose thoughts are just the laws of nature, and who does not care at all about, about us. OK. so. If you are very pretentious, you can say that this is the formula for God, for the God of Spinoza. Yeah. And uh, actually, I cannot uh, 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 refrain from quoting the ancient Indian uh, 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 wisdom. There is a, a quote by Bhagavad Gita, who really fits with this, when uh, uh, Krishna speaks to Arjuna, explaining his natural and he said, uh, if somebody knows Sanskrit, he will correct my pronunciation, I hope, because I don't know Sanskrit, of course. But he says something like, Amirtam kaiva mirtyu, sad azak ka aham, Arjuna. Which means, 
uh, immortality and death, uh, existence and non-existence, am I or Juna? Uh, this is uh, uh, somehow what you can say. And the next one of the next verses, he adds, uh, uh, um, equal for all living beings. Beings, I don't uh, like or dislike any of them. So this is the indifference of uh, of, uh, 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 the, uh, of God uh, of Einstein's God in, uh, for human beings. And you can comment on what we can do. We can just admire this marvelous logic which seems to exist in nature, and just uh, think of another piece of Indian uh, wisdom, which is the most famous mantra: "Who every good." Uh, uh, English repeats in the morning and at the sunset. He says, "Tat sabitur varenyam bargo de vasia imahi diyonah prachodayat," which means we meditate on the divine reality and brightness of the source of everything, uh, made enlighten our intellect. So this may be our attitude against, uh, in front of the laws of nature. But it fights dramatically with the postmodern attitude, which uh, was so diffused in philosophy till a few uh, years ago. We started maybe in the, in, with Wittgenstein, who claimed the laws of na physics as nothing that uh, our conventions. And this is spectacularly uh, contradicted. But this is one reason why this uh, uh, philosophy goes around to difficulties, because they think, like, even Popper seemed to think that the law of nature is even exactly true, true or is false. When you show that the uh, Newton's law are not exactly true, you don't throw Newton's laws into the garbage. You just have changed the borders of validity, making made them precise. And we can never know exactly to how little a uh, um, a, 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 a law of nature. Anyway, knowing with this uh, intrinsic imprecision, a law of nature, to me is the only undoubtable form of knowledge that we have. And this also the, the answer to another philosopher, an American philosopher who 50 years ago wrote a, a famous paper with the title, Is Justified True Belief Knowledge? Well, this is the wrong notion of knowledge to ask him more than justify the true belief that one, that the one that we get from natural law. So this on the uh, uh, philosophical side for what knowledge concerns, I will just uh, not show maybe the last slide, but tell you very shortly what. What does this have to do with our views of the life in general, right? Uh, uh, no, in normal life, you don't care about scientific knowledge. You care about uh, eating, surviving, and uh, having some form, some form, form of happiness. But apart from this, n the, the basic necessities, if you look for happiness, what is happiness? This is a very difficult question. But you can so think of examples. You have to think of something which is enduring, which does not depend of fighting with others. It does not depend of anything which can be taken out of you once you have it. And examples, when you listen to a very good concert, when you read a poem, when you, uh, you look at a wonderful painting, when you read the scientific test and you get some bright and clear explanation of something or other. In one word, it's culture. So to me, the attitude that science forces upon us towards nature, not the, the physical nature, it forces upon us also a, a, an attitude towards the universe of experiences that is summarized in the human culture, which has to be so as something outside us of which we depend. Because after all, all our emotions depend on our, our culture. If we had no culture, our emotion would just be I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I'm satisfied with what I drank, as well as what I ate, and some similar things I will not mention. So uh, um, it's clear that even when you fall in love with a girl or with a boy, according to your gender, uh, uh, you 
your falling in love depends upon the, the nice pictures of the Madonna of Giovanni Belli you have seen, or the nice pictures of, of nice uh, young men you have seen from the, from the Renaissance on. Yeah. So it's your culture which makes you what you are. So if you, the, the only way to answer the question that was in the title, so I'm forced to say some words, and my real apologize to be so long, but I have to say some words on that. To me, the real answer to the question is that uh, the attitude that science teaches you to have in front of nature is also an attitude teaches you an attitude towards the, our emotional uh, background. It, it forces you to put culture as a teacher and as a scope. Yeah? And uh, in the end, what you have to do is just to exchange in the, our uh, uh, contemporary world the scale of values, which nowadays you, uh, is occupied the top by the market with this degeneration, which is the financial market, which is destroying itself in some sense. At least it destroys us in itself. Yeah? And you have to exchange the order, you have to put the culture the first top. And uh, uh, let me quote Dante to end. Uh, you can say of uh, culture what he says uh, in the Purgatorio at some point. You can paraphrase that, referring to culture as a place where per quanti si dice più li nostro, tanto possiede più di ciascuno. The more people enjoy that, the more rich is everybody. This is a property that only culture has. So this is, uh, the, to me, the only way to get out of prehistory. If you try to, do, to draw moral consequence of this principle, you see that everything comes out of it respect of life, negation of death penalty, whatever you like comes out of the consequence of this principle. And I led with these words, just showing the reference list. This may be. I'm not I'm not waiting now. Waiting for me <laughs> in my office. So very quickly the, if there are urgent questions otherwise you can obviously continue your discussion with the speaker privately. Some urgent question. <laughs> yes, of course. Well, I see that in one of those papers you discuss well. First of all, thanks for your large and all-encompassing views <laughs> of our culture and of the scientific enterprise. So I am touching a very marginal problem, but I see that you are speaking of the measurement process. So my question is specific. Do you think that the solution of the measurement process, which is based on the idea that macroscopically different situation the macroscopically different situation belongs to super selected manifold, the Yauk idea, the Neri Loinger, Prosperi, and so on, is a good idea, or as Wigner says, does not solve the problem at all? In a sense, I think this is the way out, because my point of view is that you have to distinguish. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, you have to distinguish between two sides of the measurement apparatus, the microscopic parts and the macroscopic part, which uh, have the role of just amplifying the result to our scale. And this second part is made by an enormous number of particles uh, that you treat uh, normally as if they were infinite. In the case of infinitely many particles, the different states you end up are super selected. And this is why the um, interference terms disappear in the limit. Of course, they reappear actually in the limit where this number of particles goes to infinity. But when it is very large, it is practically infinity. You cannot see the interference terms. But actually, if you think of the actual measurement process, pro processes that we know, in uh, all cases, I can imagine, there is a phase transition involved which is in a, a bubble chamber, the transition from a liquid to gas or the bubbles. 
but also the discharge in the counter is a sort of a phase transition. The discharge in the scintillation counter is a sort of a phase transition. All times there is some. Scusa, Guido, sforato, ho visto adesso. Scusate, ho sforato in mezz'ora, scusami. Ciao. Uh, in all these cases, there is a sort of phase transition between two states which in the end, in the uh, limit where the number of constituents become infinite, as uh, vector states of inequivalent representation, therefore there is no uh, interference at all. So this cancels the interferences at the microscopic level. This is it. But all this, to my point of view, this was the content of this discussion, has to be described at a local level, because you never do in practice a global measurement. You only measure something here in a small volume and for a small interval of time, and you cannot say anything about what happens outside. And this removes completely any form of paradox or paradoxical contained from EPR, from Einstein Podolsky and Rosa. Okay. Thank you for the patience. <laughs> <And> the <laughs>